Make it happen, y'all. He just stepped in and it's about to go down. Trust me. What up, Dusty One? Lonzo, what up, my dude? Oh, man, I'm living like a midget, but I'm growing every day. That's what's up. That's what's up, man. A lot to talk about tonight. Shout out to the chat. Shout out to everybody, all the subscribers and everything. Lots to get into, but let's talk about uh, the big story today for Dr. Dre. He got his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, man. Talk to me, Lance. Congratulations to my brother. I'm proud of you. I uh, would, would have loved the invitation, though, you know. Um, and that's probably the underlying the underlying uh, conversation between the fellas that rolled with him back in the day. Nobody got an invitation. Yellow didn't get one. I didn't get one. Clientele didn't get one. Uh, you know, and it's like, it's real. You want to support things like that. But it's hard to do it from a from a spectator's position, especially when you've been, been such an intricate part of somebody's career. Why do you think that is that you weren't invited? I don't know, Doc. Maybe uh, you know, it's part of maybe it's part of the amnesia that I've seen in the past when it comes to world class wrecking crew. Yeah. Well, let's play a little bit of Dr. Dre's speech. Just to uh, give everybody a little idea of what uh, was said. Uh, if you it. The idea of being memorialized on the Hollywood Walk of Fame is an incredible tribute to my artistry. Growing up in Compton, I never imagined that I would one day be represented here amongst some of my childhood heroes. You know, we've heard the saying a million times before: focus on your passion, and the rest will follow. And that's exactly what I, what it is for me. Pouring my whole soul and self into my passion for hip hop led me on a pathway to an incredible career and i've been fortunate enough to make a living doing exactly what i love to do that's very important i'll stop it right there not too much uh else you know to say really but um shout out to og steve real quick and looking out og steve much love appreciate you bro appreciate you hey lonzo something i found out um just this past week i knew about the brain aneurysm thing a few years ago we discussed that on the show back in the day with dr dre but did you know that he had three strokes after that you know, uh, I noticed that, dude. Um, I saw. <clears throat> I, I get a. I get a. Um, I get daily notifications on myself, Dre, Q, Compton, and uh, yeah, this, the, those 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 four situations. And I noticed the last three or four days, the three the three strokes got more uh, notifications than the, than the um, than the um, star on the Walk of Fame. I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, never even knew that, and man, that's strokes are no joke. No, man, that's I got two thing. buddies right now. Two buddies right now that dealing with the uh, after effects of strokes, and of all the stuff that's frightening, man, cancer's frightening, heart attacks are frightening, but strokes it puts you in a, like a state of uh, of purgatory. You can see everything around you, but you can't do much with it, and that's man, that's really. My dad died from a stroke, so it was really near and dear to my heart. My grandma, my grandmother, my mother's side, she had a stroke. And it's it just, it takes, it, you're here, but you're not here. And that's that's really hard to deal with from both sides of the fence, man. Somebody that you, that you love, that you care about, that you can go visit, but you can't have a conversation with in some cases. Somebody, you know, you, you can't go walking with, you can't, you know, you can't do what you do because they're not the same people no more, man. And it's, it's really it's a heartbreaking experience. And any it's nothing I want to experience, um, um, for, for, me, for me personally, I've seen enough of it myself. So please, God. Yeah, man, definitely. Hey, I have a question for you, Lonzo, about Dre. You know, Dre had many eras in his career. He had the World Class Wrecking Crew era. He had the Ruthless Records era. He had the Death Row Records era. And he had the Aftermath era. If you could pick your favorite era of Dr. Dre's, which one would you pick? I'd have to share between the World Class Wrecking Crew era and the... Uh, the uh, Death Row era. The World Class Wrecking Crew era for me, because I was a directly a part of all of that in the very beginning with him, Easy, and everybody, to see it start to manifest and become what it became was kind of exciting in one way, but then it got funky as he got as he perfected his musical sound. It got it got perfected in the Death Row era, to my opinion. Rufus was good. You know, he had some good songs with Rufus, but when it came to the Death Row era, that was a whole nother level right there. Death Row was my pick, my favorite. In fact, my favorite time in hip hop personally would be 
I would say from 92 to about 96, just personally, I was in high school and, and the Dre, the G funk, and it was just everything to me back then. So I'm going, I'm definitely going Dre death row. But you know what though? That was probably one of the most tragic uh, eras in hip hop as well. We lost a lot of people in that era, man. We lost easy Tupac, Biggie, um, club started getting shut down. I mean, the effects of gangster rap started to started to hit us, um, you know, in a way we didn't expect. You know, people took gangster rap as just a, as a musical format, but it was a lifestyle for a lot of people, man. And for somebody who's been around the entertainment business as long as I have, to remember when LA had 50, 60, 70 clubs, I mean, literally, everybody in his mama with a liquor license and four walls and a roof would put a DJ in there and turn it into a club. It was a restaurant during the daytime, whether it was El Torito's or um, Red, uh, not Red Robin, um, damn it, uh, damn it, uh, Red Onion, whatever the case may be. You know, all these facilities turned into clubs after a certain time. They still sold liquor. They still sold appetizers, but it was a good party era. And the music made for a party atmosphere, but it also generated a lot of negative energy. And that's where the problem came in. Why do I remember the Red Onion? Why does that sound so familiar to me? And someone else mentioned it in the... I speak about the Red Onion with a smile on my face and a love in my heart because the Red Onion was the spot. Is that the one in Lakewood? Lakewood? They had one in Lakewood, but the one okay. everybody went to was the one on Wilshire. They had a happy hour that would not quit. They had all the beautiful females that wore business outfits come downstairs from the various offices and and suites around Wilshire Boulevard, and they ascended upon uh, Will, um, Red Onion on Wilshire for happy hour. I think it was like Tuesday or Thursday, and man, it was just oh my god! I still got I got friends from that at a restaurant today. I'm still friends to this day. Okay, I did well over there. I did very well. Okay, and then they tried. They did the same thing in Lakewood for a while, and Lakewood was cool. They had they, they did the same thing in Lakewood. The Black Angus in Lakewood had a uh, had a had the club situation going on. All the El Torinos had a club thing going on. But that mentality, man, when you put when you put um, that gangster mentality in uh, an establishment like a Red Onion or a uh, El Torito or whatever, and you've got people getting stabbed, shot, whatever the case may be, beat up in, in facilities, it ain't, it ain't worth the brand. It ain't worth risking the brand over. So they shut it all down. Yeah, these kids don't know. Back in the 90s, I was probably the last generation to actually have a lot of places to go to. You know, now there's nowhere to go to dance. So you, we've talked about this before. There's nowhere to go because the 90s messed everything up, man. The 90s messed everything. Well, you know, the 90s and the mentality of the 90s. Everybody was in was in uh, proof, uh, in self proof, self proving themselves back in the 90s. Every, nobody was really hard in the 80s. In the, in, the, in the mid '90s, people started acting hard and getting harder because that was the musical sound. That the streets got harder. You couldn't wear uh, a slacks and t-shirt, slacks and uh, dress shoes anymore. You had to wear tennis shoes. You had to wear jeans. Clubs would let people in with jeans sometimes. So the tennis shoes definitely had not taken over yet, and uh, it was a big scuffle because guys would come to the, come to a club. My club was a perfect example. Come to my club. Dressed in nice jeans, nice tennis shoes, but they were not the fashion of the party era yet. Okay, they had not been accepted yet, and you you would have a problem, or you would lose money more than anything. You would lose a lot of money uh, by not letting people in with jeans or tennis shoes, because jeans and tennis jeans and or tennis shoes were not allowed in clubs back in the day, dude. It was just a whole different mindset, and it wasn't until um, maybe mid late. Uh, 90s people started loosening up because Jordans came out and I mean, Jordans got more popular and people treated Jordan like they were dress shoes, you know, and then you you got on some some nice Jordans. You want to put on some jeans to relax in. And, you know, they had you know they had the FUBU and the Sean John and the cross colors and all those clothing styles gave, uh, you know, gave a, gave fashion a new look. And I guess, you know, because you're missing money, you, you get let it slide. But because people are comfortable now. They had a different attitude, and you know all that shit just kind of went away. Just like just like Sean John and Fubu and Cross Colors, they all went away. Only thing still standing today is Jordans. Yep. Do you remember? Was Jordans was that the first time people were actually killing each other over over a uh, 
Actually, I'm remembering the leather jacket thing. I was about to ask you, is Jordan's, the, the, I guess, the big one that everybody was dying over that, you know, made the news and everything? But then I was remembering the, you know, the leather jackets from the 70s. Was the there anything jacket, in between that? The leather jacket started it. Um, no, nah, I can't recall anything. Oh, you might have got jacked for your hats back in the day. You get jacked for Ace Deuce if you had on the um, um, or Ace Deuce, if you were uh, Stingy Brim. They call them Stingy Brim for Ace Deuces. If you weren't from a certain hat, it would t- a certain group, they would take your hat from you. That's for that. But it wasn't like like uh, like it was the leather jacket. Leather jackets were just a trend that if you had one on, you couldn't keep it. Starter jackets, yeah, maybe, yeah. yeah he might be right. Starter jackets might have might have been uh, a trend for a while, but they you know they didn't have the same impact that leather jacket. I mean, leather jackets would get you killed. Starter jackets get you jacked. You know, <clears throat> then came. Um, Killer Dayton's, the what the rims. If we talk about stuff people were dying for, the rims, the you know, best gold Dayton's. Oh man, come on, dude! You can't park. You can't make a left turn in L.A. Back in the, you could make a left turn. You could. You did not want to get caught in the left hand turning lane because <clears throat> if you did, you might not make it out. You did not want to get caught in the left hand turning lane. Nowhere. That was just not the, not a smart not a smart thing to do. Yep, that was a real thing, kids. Nineties was a different <laughs> animal. Um, all right. Shout out to Dr. Dre, man. Let's move on to a few stories. We're going to take a trip to the Niggaverse, Lonzo. I think it's been about a month and a half, almost two months since we've visited the uh, Niggaverse. We've had a lot of hip hop stuff to talk about. Time for this one to come home. What you got? Man, first story, Lonzo. <clears throat> a list of things women need for, quote, maintenance is going viral. This is a list of things that women need. I'm going to read it off right now. Women's maintenance. Waxing, $60. Nails, toes, $75 to $130. Hair, $80 to $400. Facials. I'll give you a facial for free. $60 to $150. Brows, $12 to $30. Lashes, $80 to $120. And then there's a caption in this same post. That $100 you're trying to send is not enough, sir. Talk to me, Lonzo. First of all, ain't no man ever said to a woman, oh, baby, I'll, you'd be fine if you had some longer lashes. Oh, baby, you'd be fine if you had a fa- had a facial. Uh, oh, baby, you'd be fine if you had some red bottoms. We don't care. Most of the things you just mentioned outside of the waxing, now the waxing could be a little bit on the... Helpful side. I might, I might kick in for a good waxing. Cause yeah. Uh, anyway, that's long. That's the Even the nails. If you feel your nails are pretty, that but any all that other shit, nah. If you want, you, when you when when your hand your hand is on certain parts of the body, you want to see a good look. You don't want no chipped up nails. Again, another subject, another time. But I'm just saying certain things that brothers do like nails, toes. Brothers like that. Okay, I can see doing that. Okay, but within reason. Come on, babe. Don't make don't have me do something for you that you won't do for yourself. If you can't do it yourself, why I got to do it? Okay. I understand it's great to be helpful. What the question is, where is the men's list at? The brothers ain't got no list like that. Ain't no list for the brothers. So we do all this right Clean here. Clean draws and a haircut. Okay. You we do we do all this right here in exchange for have uh relations, have some fun and wait, 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 wait. And, and most of these women require this and you ain't even my woman. We just dating. I don't know if I like you like that or not. Okay. When you watch some of these YouTube videos, I know some of them, most of them are, are, are bull or pretty much. I got a, I got a, a, a youngster in the room, so I can't, I can't, I ain't going to go off on Lonzo today, but it, they, they, they've been on, on, on the fake side. So when you see a woman, you know, getting a guy's car, cause he got a nice car, take me shopping, spend the bag on me. I don't even know you. Why would I do that? Because you're cute. How much do I owe you? For, what is the fee, the admission for being cute? What is your brain? I mean, it was, once cute wears off, okay? This is the problem women don't understand. If a man does all that right there, he claiming ownership. You can't do nothing else. If he's doing all that right there, okay, he is not going to stand by and let you just come out, oh, oh. I'll get back with you later on. I got a date. I got a, no, 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 no. You, you, you're putting yourself in position 
to be owned. Now, if you don't mind being owned, and depending on how much money this brother got, he may own you and a few more like you. Now, what you gonna do? Now, because you can't wait, 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 wait. Because now you put yourself in a, a unique situation. If he making five, six high fives, six figures, and he got all the six pack and the looks and the car and the house and the credit, no kids, and you he doing all this for you. And he sees somebody else he want to do it for too. If he can afford to do it, like they say, it ain't tricking if you can if you can afford it. Do you get mad? Do you think you're gonna just go out and date somebody else with all his accessories on you? Okay, this is it's not a bad, it's not a good look. It's a bad idea, bro. It's a really a bad idea. Yes, you look good, but what's the price of looking good? For this brother to pull up on you and you know with, with a bad attitude. Or him to take everything from you because you didn't put yourself in a position where you can't even look good unless this man is sponsoring you. Come on now. Come on. What you really want to do here? How are you going to be the independent, the strong, independent black woman if you got somebody else taking care of all your needs? Can you take care of these same needs yourself? Dude, don't get me started. This right. I have, to take, I have to lift the offering. I will start preaching. I will start preaching. Come on, dude. I see this too much. Why do I have to do all this just to meet you? Then I can't take you to a... Um, <laughs> I can't take you to a, 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 a mid-level restaurant like the Cheesecake Factory. Get out of here with that. How, why don't I just give you the money? Because here, 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 here's, what, here's what it's going to boil out to. Give me a price what it's going to cost me to spend time with you. You do all, all the stuff you're going to do yourself. Because basically, you just turn yourself to a prostitute. You just turn yourself to a prostitute. If it costs all that to be with you, uh, give me a price. I'm going to swipe my credit card. We're going to do what we're going to do. I'm going to go about my business. You're going about yours. You go to the nail shop, the, the wax shop, the facial shop, the hair shop, do all that right there. Because that's basically what you're doing. You put yourself in the same. You might as well be walking down Figueroa or get your OnlyFans page. And I'm going to come by when it's my time or my turn. And I'm going to treat you just like that. You ain't going to. And you can't. You All you got is material. You ain't got nothing else. If all you want is material, that, that's the lane for you. Be a prostitute. But if you want something more than that. It, it can't come on a price tag like that. Mm-mm. Nope. And if it takes that much to make you pretty, you're most likely ugly as fuck. If it takes all that body and fender work to get you to look like something I want to spend some time with, we got another problem. Facts, dude. Facts. Shout out to Rosetta Tate, actress in the building. I'm looking at her pictures right now, and she definitely doesn't need all of that stuff. She is a natural beauty. Check her out in some of her movies. Check out her IMDb. She's sitting in the this studio with me today. Oh, okay. She there you go. The- there you go. That's my partner. That's my mentee. My mentee. She came by today. Her and her lovely daughter. No, they're kicking it. They're in the studio. That's why I say I, I got to be nice today. I got to. I got to get. Uh, I got to in, in in studio guest today. <laughs> love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Well, shout out to you. Welcome to the show. Let's keep it pushing, Lonzo. We are gonna unfortunately stay in the. Megaverse, and this is one that uh, was pretty sad to me, but um, a Chicago man was killed after his baby mama dropped his address on Facebook so his ops can pull up on him. Now, I'm going to read the tweet or the uh, the, the actual uh, message that she put on Facebook. She says, my baby daddy got the weakest ops. He just keeping home alive. He just coming home alive and untouched. Ain't he snitch on half of y'all? Ain't he rob half of y'all? Question mark. Anyways. He is not located in 4250 such and such street. I repeat, he is not. She dropped the ad- Addy and homeboy is a done deal. Well, she just got herself an accessory to murder case. Bye. Bye, Felicia. Okay. You put him in direct line of fire. You put him in direct danger. You're, in, you're a conspirator to that murder. Bye, Felicia. I, why would you do that to your baby daddy? You mad because he didn't get your hair done, your nails done, your your wax? What you what what did he do to put you that mad? But you put it, you put his life at, at danger. Then you go insult the op to make it. Oh my god! You insulted the man's ops and gave him the address to where he was so they can so they can retaliate against him. And bye, Felicia. Bottom line, yeah. you, just, you you might as well pull the trigger yourself. Yeah. Do these people not watch news? Do they not know this? Are they too high? What do you think the problem is with people still doing this in 2024? A lot of people are stupid. 
stupid is a very is, is, a, is a very prominent disease these days, especially amongst our young people. It's, it's, it, it takes it takes over the, uh, the mind of a lot of these youngsters, and they think if they didn't pull the trigger, they don't understand the law whatsoever. If you do anything that's complicit, assisted in anybody's demise, you are a, you are a co-conspirator. She'll be in court right next to them cats and them ops. They all she'll be in court right next to them with well, the DA crying about what she didn't do, but he ain't here, so therefore now you you just lost your child support, your baby daddy just lost a daddy. You're going to jail. Your kid might end up in foster care. Hopefully you got somebody to take care of them. You just changed everybody's life by being whatever you want to be. I came sick because I got guests in the house today. You just changed everybody's lives, including your own, by being a little, little uh, you know what I'm talking about, female dog in heat. Yeah, Chris said that's a good point. He said Gen Zs are so dumb. They grew up with all this technology and don't know any better. We grew up before the technology and we know better. Half, half these folks don't know, don't, 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 don't know who they all been or city councilman is. Half of them don't know the civics of their own neighborhood, and you wonder why. I would say ninety percent of them. A good, a good, a you're, good you're being nice with saying half. The, uh, most of them, dude, I like, and I'm, I'm almost guilty myself. I didn't really pay attention till I got a little older. I didn't either till my thirties, man. Till I owned a home, till I bought property, till I owned a business. When you become a stakeholder, a, a stakeholder in a community. You have a whole new attitude about your representation, the police department. And once you buy a house and then go on the way, you got a thirty-year commitment. You need to know everybody around you: the police chief, the, the fire department, the mayor, the city council person, your state senator. Excuse me, your state senator. Your um, your uh, federal representatives, all them people, they're always around. They're, they're easy to find when it comes vote time. And get their numbers and get their email addresses and stay in contact with them and let them know that you exist. Because at every, almost every session, they're voting for something that could change your life, possibly change your life. I, I was even, um, I was working with uh, Mike Davis, the state uh, assemblyman. And he, I was, I had a meeting with him. He asked me my opinion on something that he had to vote on. And it was something about Little League football. Little League football, a lot, of, a lot of these kids, parents have put them in positions where they can get hurt at a very, very early age, especially in Little League football. They're playing tackle at Little League football. And these kids don't know how to hit, they don't know how to fall, they don't know nothing. They don't know nothing about nothing. But they're out there playing. And some of these, and, and, and some of these leagues, they don't have weight limits. They got kids bigger than me out there. I'm about, I'm 12. Man. <laughs> this little McDonald's stuff fool is not 12 years old. If he is, you need to cut out the Big Macs, baby. He's too big. But so you got kids that are being mixed max, guys are getting kids are getting hurt. So they wanted to pass a law. I forgot the number of the law. That there was no no tackle football between, I think, maybe six and 12 years old, something like that. I, don't hold me to the actual age. And I did a little survey with people who coach football. They thought it was a good idea. But because he knows people, but he, he don't have boots on the ground, he wanted to get a, an opinion. And he asked me to find people who actually coach football, Little League football, to get their opinion. And I did. And he voted uh, you know, accordingly. But it was that's how, how boots on the ground politics can be. Things like that can change your life. Now, you got some parents who want their kids to toughen up, blah, 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 blah. And they well, they need to rough toughen up a little bit. No, they they, they want they want to still gonna have on helmets and pads, but they're gonna play flag until they at least get 12, 13 years old, whatever the age limit is. Okay, and I think that's fair. Give them a chance to learn the sport properly, so they learn how to hit, learn how to fall, learn how to tackle. They have a, uh, that reduces their chances of get of getting permanently hurt. We got kids that ended up in in traction, man, with head injuries. Cause they don't know about you know uh, not to hit a kid in the head. In fact, when I was in little league, they taught me to hit him in the head. Hello, me too. In the nineties, dog. When I was playing um, Pop Warner football at Gardena High School, they told me when I was uh, a guard on the de- defensive guard, and I also played middle linebacker. They told me when I, if I could get to the get to the center, hit him on the side of the head with the heel of my shoe, with the heel, heel of my hand. Bam! Do that shit about four or five times. He gonna he gonna get disor- disorientated. That's so true. Shit, the coach used to hit me in, in the 90s, looking back. 
And you're, you're so true. You're so right, Lonzo. I played football for eight years of my life, and I 100% agree with that. I don't think young kids should play, uh, should play full-on contact football. In Pop Warner, even though it's regulated, it's not regulated. When I was playing Pop Warner football, Lonzo, I would be scared shitless to play Long Beach Poly. They, they had a Pop Warner team because they're supposed to be 12, Lonzo, and I'm at the line right now. I'm looking at this dude with a full-grown beard. This motherfucker <laughs> got a tattoo on his face. I'm like, there's no way this dude is 12. Big old Samoan cat. And they would, I would get my bell rung every once in a while. And looking back, no, nah, I don't think kids should go through that. It, I was so skinny. And I played for the Guardian Stars in 1970, 70, 69. I weighed like 88 pounds. You had to weigh at least 100. I mean, I had to weigh 90 pounds to play that day. I had to put other people's shoes in my helmet to make the weight. No lie. I had to put other people's shoes in my helmet to make the weight. But again, if you didn't make the weight, a couple times, I didn't, I didn't, first few times, I didn't know that trick. I had to sit on the bench. I didn't weigh enough. And eventually, my coaches gave me a little, little heads up. Hey, try this right here. And it gave me my, my partner's shoes. I made the weight and took his shoes back, and it was cool. I didn't play that much no way, but I was there. I was able to play. Different time, man. Some Sometimes change is, is good, and I agree with that 100%. Uh, let's move on. Before we do, we're almost halfway through the show, so I'm going to remind everybody to smash that like button if you haven't already. Just please do it right now really quick. It really helps out the algorithm. This is your first time joining the channel and you like what you hear. You are tuned in to NWA Stories with Lonzo. That is Alonzo Williams, the godfather of West Coast Hip Hop. I am Dusty Vision. We welcome you to the show. Now we're going to stay in the uh, niggaverse, Lonzo, uh, maybe for one more story. This one's kind of sad, man. Um, it's a big story that just happened a few days ago. But a teen girl was fatally stabbed after rejecting a guy who was hitting on her. I'm going to play this uh, about minute and 30 second news clip um, just to give everybody an idea of the story and you as well if you haven't heard it. This happened in New York at a bodega. Unimaginable heartbreak for a family tonight after 19-year-old twin sisters were both stabbed in Park Slope early this morning. One of the sisters tonight has succumbed to her injuries. Fox 5's Kendall Green has more on the brutal attack. She's taking it real hard. You know, you never expect nothing like this to happen. What are you going to do? Alfonso Goodson is facing a level of grief he never imagined he'd feel after getting a sobering call Sunday about his granddaughter, 19-year-old Samaya Spain. Said granddaddy Tanaya, Tamaya got stabbed and she died. You know. What was your reaction? I couldn't believe it. My wife started crying and everything. Police got the call about a stabbing around 2:20 Sunday morning, and someone stabbed Samaya and her twin sister right outside of the Natural Plus Bodega in Park Slope, Brooklyn. Mohammed Albar, who works at the store, watched the girls grow up. They're very nice girls. I know the family. They, it's very nice. So sad to see them. One on scene says some guys were hanging out at the store, hitting on the group of girls who just walked in. Here we go. One of them guys had complimented the uh, two girls that I walked in with their friends, and they they um, said no. The group started going back back and forth arguing before one of the men walked down the block angrily, according to witnesses. Minutes later, one of the men in his 20s, they say, came banging and kicking on the bodega doors with the girls still inside. Workers locked the door until he walked away again. When they unlocked the doors, that's when the attack happened. A guy in all black had stabbed one of the girls in her neck and the other in her arm and ran. Leaving the knife he used right there on scene. Talk to me, man. I'm trying to figure out Oh, that's, that's, that's a tough one, Doc, because you wonder what people are thinking when they do something like that, because everybody saw you do it. You left the knife there. Are you embarrassed or you, or you just never had a, you, you don't know how to deal with rejection or did they the girls say something that, that was so embarrassing that you had to kill them? Bottom line is you're done. Bye, Felicia. Bottom line, you're done. You got one murder and one attempted murder, and you probably all your homeboys are gonna tell on you. Trust me, they're gonna turn state's evidence because they don't want to go to jail. Um, I'm trying to figure out why they unlocked the, unlocked the door, but again, that's the, the it's really near, here and there. I just think that uh, the young, especially young men, they they do a lot of stuff based on emotion. You know, people do a lot of things on emotion, and emotion. That's a lot. I bet you if you start did a survey 
in jail and prison, a lot of the people that are locked up or behind doing making moves based on the uh, on the stressful emotional situations. And when they thought about it, oh my God, it wasn't it wasn't all that big big of a deal. But for that thirty seconds, that ten seconds, it was a big deal. And you made a decision that just changed your life for the next thirty years. Yeah, yeah, it's a sad situation. Let me ask you: Do you think it's do you think it's the weed? Do you think it's other drugs that are making these kids so emotional? I mean, I, I consider myself a good looking dude back in the day, Lonzo. And even I was turned down 98% of 99% of the time when I approach a girl. I never thought about stabbing a woman or anything like that. You know, t- getting turned down is part of growing up, dude. I mean, back in the day when you had to walk across that dance floor and ask a girl to dance, because they all was on one side, all the guys on the other side. You see somebody you, you like. Walk across that dance floor and they turn your ass around. You got to turn your ass down. You got to turn your ass around and go back across that dance floor and everybody laughing at you. Okay? That humiliation. Bill's character. Huh? Bill's character. Thank you very much. That humiliation that you that you endured crossing that dog on dance floor and her turning you down in front of her girlfriends. All right? Now, if you, if you, get, if you get accepted, you're a hero. And it was worth it was worth the 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 chance. It was worth the gamble to cross that dog on dance floor. And especially if you thought you knew the girl pretty well. If you knew her and you y'all, y'all was kind of cool, you knew that you can, you know, that would give you some ultimate hero points because you walked over there and talked to so-and-so and she said yes. But if she said no, somebody you didn't know and she said no, hey man, it's part of the game. But how you dealt with it was even was even better. You didn't call it no bitch. Oh, baby, no problem. Thank you very much. I'd ask a girl right next to you. You want to dance? I'm I'm already over here. You want to do this? You know, and sometimes I've been, I have went around the whole table. Okay. I've been around the whole and anybody want to dance, I come and dance, okay? And I just I just flip it on them. I flip it on the minute. I want to dance with you, but you too cute right now. What about you? What are you doing? Or sometimes it, it goes some game, fellas. Ask the ugly girl first, okay? Ask her, uh, act, act, act the big one first and make her happy. Then come back and get the other one. Because see, the other one, when they see you cross that dance floor, they think you're going to go to her anyway. No, 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 no. Make the, make, put, put a smile on the, on, on the friend that ain't so cute face first. And the other ones will love you for it. Okay? Just a little play a game. That's all. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's kind of what I used to do back in the day, Lonzo. But we ain't going to get into that right now. But um, it. T- Talk to me. Is it the strong weed that these kids are smoking like right away? Because I me, mean, I smoked horrible weed for 25 years before I even got introduced to this new stuff now. But, you know, like, is it the weed? Is it the, the drugs these kids are being prescribed by the doctors? Like, do you think that has any effect? If I was talking to my boy Fred, Fred Shaw from the HHAC, he would say it was the drugs. You got a lot of kids, man, that are on various type of uh, emotional drugs, Ritalin, Adderall, all kind of stuff. And as they get older, they may wing them off, the, take them off the stuff. You still got side effects. Some of these drugs have the side effect of suicide. If a drug will make you want to kill yourself, why would it make you want to kill somebody else? Think about that. They say suicide. They don't say, oh, it may, it may induce homicide too. Now, if, if it said that, it would really, it really wouldn't make. It probably would not be on the shelves we prescribe whatsoever. But if you're only talking about killing yourself, we can probably play past that. But to my killing other people, we may have a problem. But they won't tell you. It wouldn't tell you that if it, if it did. But when you look up and see all the mass murders in these cool, these kids' schools, I bet you, I wouldn't have bet you. My daddy would say a dollar to a donut. If you put it, uh, put it under under a survey or research, you'll find that most a lot of these kids are probably either on or just or just got off of one of these mind altering drugs because we we don't do that to you okay that ain't what we do i ain't never know no weed make you want to kill nobody only thing we make you want to kill is a donut a cupcake a cake a soda something like that bag of potato chips they gonna get they gonna they going to they they gonna die as quick death but i've seen weed people smoke weed and was upset and just like, man, forget about it. I'm going to sit down and enjoy my high. Exactly. <laughs> okay. I, dude, I, I, I say this all the time. I'm going to tell you again. When I first got in the corner, Avalano Segundo back in 2008 for the third time, 
I had two clubs. I had downstairs and upstairs. And I had a small army working for me for our security. All we had was alcohol. We had just started getting um, uh, medically uh, accepted. The more people started getting um, prescriptions for weed, the less, the fewer incidents I had at the club. When I first got back, oh, dude, we was wrestling with chicks all the time, dude. We was wrestling, big girls, we get to, get to fighting over dancers. But as I noticed, as we became more and more legal, my incidents went down more and more. And I followed this trend, dude. I'm trying to figure out what is going on. And by the time I left in 2019, I was down to two guards, man. But I had a balcony full of people that would smoke and come, you know, sometimes we walk in the club, but where everybody at? And they'd be on the balcony. And they come back in, and everybody sitting there, eyes tight, taco man getting paid. Even with, even with the alcohol, because the weed has a way of soothing you, you still didn't react the same way. And I tell people, uh, you'll never hear this phrase. You'll never hear this phrase, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish this joint and whoop your ass. You ain't going to hear that. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. I'm going to finish this joint. Man, go sit my ass down. I ain't thinking about you, man. Forget you, dude. Get back with me. That's usually the attitude because that is what the drug does. Alcohol will magnify whoever you are to the 10th degree. If you're a nice person, you're going to be nicer on alcohol. If you are an evil person, you're going to be worse on alcohol. Ask me how I know. Okay? Back. Like you say, E.A. Norton, we will kill some wings, some chips, some pizza. All that ain't gonna last no time, okay? But alcohol, what do you, what do you, what do you, 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 you drink alcohol? When you drink alcohol, you eat to absorb the alcohol to try so you won't throw up. But when you when you smoke weed, you're like, hey, give me the chicken wings, give me, the, yeah, it's a whole different situation. So now nah, you will never hear the phrase, "I'm gonna finish this joint, whoop your ass," never. Yep. Yep. Facts. All right. Let's uh, move on to something else, Lonzo. Let's do our uh, bit of the week where I say I recite a popular line for you, a, a popular hip hop line, and you just break it down in the best way that you can. Uh, this week's line comes from the late great Tupac. We're going to probably do a lot of his stuff. He just has so, so much good stuff. Um, and think about the uh, topics we've already discussed tonight while you break this line down. And the line is, and they say it's the white man I should fear when it's my own kind doing all the killing here. Facts. Unfortunately, facts. When I talk about the hood, you don't hear about people driving in from Orange County, the Valley, doing nothing in the hood. Everything that's done in the hood is pretty much done within a five-mile radius of the people that live there. Okay, when Long Beach and Compton was beefing, that that's maybe five, seven miles apart. Same thing with Watson Compton, five to seven miles apart. Well, no white people involved with that right there. And I know, and I know it sounds harsh, but it's it's true facts. Oh, ain't no black on black crime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. White on right, it's white on right, white on white crime too. But for some reason, we have mastered that, dude. You know, when you look at some of our leaders, they they know they've got. The system has gotten so smart, they don't even let non-black people sell dope in the community like they used to. You think about this. Used to be a time you saw those 70s movies. Who was the man? The white guy in a big old house. All the people worked for. Right. Who, you don't know who the kingpin of meth is. You don't know the kingpin of crack is outside of the black folks. They didn't bring that stuff in here. You knew about the Latino, the black and the brown people that was involved in it. Which one of them on the planes? Which one of them on the uh, on the ships? Do you think all that stuff came through them ports without somebody know what was in them containers? Come on, man, keep it one hundred. But when it came to the street soldiers, the, the street providers, everybody knew their names. Everybody knew all the names. Everybody knew what they did. I was talking about this today in another conversation. When I look at some of the TV shows on stars, every last one of them are about drugs. You would think that's the yep. only, only hustle that we ever known in our lives. And they try to project, present this as our culture. Come on, man. That ain't our culture. 
I here, here's something I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell on myself. I was hanging out in Compton the other day that last Thursday. Saw a buddy of mine, and he's one of my old dancers from the club. But he's a real cool brother. I'm gonna give him a shout out. Um, Mike, uh, trouble, not trouble. Uh, prop, was it problem? Yeah, problem. And he's always been cool with me. We kick it all the time. I saw him at the post office, and um. We were talking about his the show he was a part of at one time called uh, All the Queen's Men. And he said, yeah, man, so-and-so on the show, so-and-so on the show. A lot of them guys used to work for me at Eve After Dark. I mean, at, at the Boom Boom Room, Eve After Dark, same thing, okay? And I know these guys. I know them personally. And so I, I tuned in sat Sunday. I wasn't doing anything Sunday. I was kind of kicking it, but no football on. So I was kicking it and watching. I started watching All the King's Men. And I've been kind of following it. For the last couple of days, I've been kind of binge watching this show for the last couple of days, and I see I see a pattern with all the so-called black shows. Either you are murderous, killing, um, drug dealing, money laundering, something or another, or you a church killing, <laughs> drug dealing. <laughs> Come on, man! We only got we only have two characters. And, and, and all the women are the most notorious. When you look at the um, Raising Canaan, a, a homegirl, the mama, oh, my God. When you see uh, a madam from uh, from all my um, all the Queen's men, oh, man, she killed about 100 dudes. Huh? Even Marcel. Marcel killed about 100 people, man. <laughs> she didn't kill 100 people. Yeah. She didn't kill more, brother, more people than a Rocky movie. Okay? I ain't lying. She she drops she drops about three to six bodies an episode. She does, and she got all these bodyguards. But she goes out and does she does a lot of her work herself. And I, I'm at the part right now. She just had a guillotine built to cut a cut a woman's head off. Okay, cut 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 the head and the hands off. Had a guillotine built to cut this woman's head off. So I'm trying to understand why is it so important that we have these kind of shows. I, everything is one up and. One up in the other ones, and I watched. I used to love the wire, uh, you know, from just the, the 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 realness of the wire. And I remember that name is Mama, the guy with the big ponytail. His Mama, she wasn't shit. Excuse my friend, she wasn't nothing, man. She made got mad because her son wasn't the soldier his daddy was, and beat. Well, it was mad at him because he couldn't go out there and work. He didn't do that. That wasn't in him. She was hurt by you. Got to do this to take care of me. Why? I got to risk going to the penitentiary and sit next to my daddy who already got life to take care of your big butt. You see the mama, uh, Mary J. Blige's character. Come on, man. She ain't no joke. She ain't no joke in power, man. I mean, all these, these notorious women that will kill you at the drop of a hat. Now, they may be some that exist, but I'm just saying this is, this is the female imagery that our young girls are getting. You got that, then you got the sexy red whole other conversation. You got mamas that cook in red bottoms and furs and diamonds. It's, it's, I'm watching this chick make, make dinner in a, in a in a Louis Vuitton outfit or whatever, whatever, you know, whatever these females is. She got she got the purse, she got the gun, she got and everybody got all these guys behind them, but they run in the organization. All these guys are either scared of them or got so much respect for them more than they would the average dude. Okay. And I just think it's kind of interesting, man. I just really, really, this is like this between uh, Power, Can Raising Canaan, and uh, all the Queen's men. These got, to, uh, they, these got to be the most killer women I've ever seen in all my life. And then all these bodies drop with no little to no retribution. Now, there's always a cop looking for them. They never catch them, though. You never catch them. And it, and then it's almost that will almost remind me of uh, my boy um, Ke uh, what's his name Keanu Reeves in um, what it, what's his show is his movies Keanu Reeves uh, Speed uh, well, oh uh, come on man help me out Bill and Ted's uh, Keanu nah, Reeves one, what he always kept shooting everybody. oh uh, oh I know Bardo Wick or uh, Wick yeah, uh, John Wick, Wick right John Wick. Yeah, there nah, it remind me of John Wick. John Wick killed a hundred people a movie. He killed a hundred people a movie. He everybody gets two bullets, one in the chest, one in the head. One in the chest, one in the head. 
John Wick got on the suit that stops bullets, but he ain't got no hat on. And he gonna get shot in the head. You got all these bullets flying, machine guns. He ain't never got his ears nicked or nothing. This is bull. And I'm just, I, I, I know it's fantasy. I know it's action, but it don't make no sense how somebody could have all these bullets flying. Now, he'll, oh, he'll take his, if John Wick could take his, his shirt off and bullets just fall out like rice, okay? But ain't not one, no one, but nobody ever thought about shooting him in the head. The same thing with these characters you see on these female characters. Bullets is flying everywhere. Ain't nobody got nicked yet. And, and they don't miss. Like John Wick, they don't miss. They don't miss. They take out three or four cats. Pow, 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 pow. Guys with machine guns and team running. They just ducking down a little bit like, like she got the force. Or, you know, just amazing, man, how these um, shows portray this, this superhero BS. That I just find, you know, kind of over the top. It's it, it's kind of funny, but you also know it's affecting somebody who don't who think this is really really possible, and that's the part that's dangerous. Yep, yep, yeah. Let's move on, Lonzo. Uh, about twelve minutes left, thirteen minutes left. Uh, last story I'd like to talk about before we get to some questions from the audience. Thirty three years ago, this past week. Latasha Harlins, age 15, was fatally shot by a Korean store shop owner over a bottle of orange juice. Many say this is the spark that started the L.A. riots. What do you remember about hearing that story for the first time 33 years ago? I remember that story very vividly. I used to go to that store every time I visit my auntie. That store was on 92nd and 97th in Figueroa. My auntie lived on the same street. I'd always go to that store. For, my auntie always sent me to the store for whatever reason. I don't know. I don't know if that was the same lady that was behind the counter, but I remember it. Like, Damn, I go there sometime. Um, it was totally left-handed, man. Uh, it was no way in the world that woman should should have got probation. She was an older Korean lady, but that wouldn't have flu- that wouldn't have flew nowhere else. It was not. It was not possible for something like that to happen. Her not go to jail. Her to get probation? Not get deported? Nothing? She got probation for that shit. She got a long term of probation. Who does that? Girl unarmed behind uh, some orange juice. She was a little smart ass, but still, it don't it don't warrant a bullet in the head. But again, folks got mad, and I, I think I forgot what Johnny played. What role Johnny played in that? Uh, Johnny Cochran. Yeah. He played a role. He's talking. I'll look it up. He played some role. Now, I don't know whether he was representing the uh, the family or the Korean lady that was shot. I don't know. I'm not sure. He he, he, play, he No, played I think role. it was the latter. Now that you say that, but I'll keep keep talking. I'll uh, look it up. I think he played, he did definitely played a role in that situation. Now the first time I really remember here remember hearing his name. In any, any kind of prominent situation, because I thought it was kind of weird that he was involved, and I think he was on the Korean side for whatever reason. I'm not sure. I want to say he was. Yeah, I mean, I don't see anything about their names being connected like that, but okay, Natasha uh, Harlan. Yep. We'll leave that. We'll leave it alone. I won't. I won't push the issue on that. But yeah, just uh, something. Something in the back of my mind. Um, that sounds his, familiar for some reason. Like yeah. This, yeah. He, he was involved in that some way, form, and fashion. What side he was on, I can't recall right now. Maybe we'll figure it out next week. But, yeah, that, that was a, a situation that was very frustrating because it was it was no justification for that. And the girl had the money. And that's the bad part. It was I think it was just the interaction because at that time, uh, a lot of store owners, a lot of non-black store owners had a habit of following you around the store. That was some irritating shit to no end, okay? You walk in somebody's store, and just like in uh, in uh, Friday, uh, you buy, you buy, you buy. You you hurry up, you buy. Hey, man, I just walked in this joint, okay? And it was very disrespectful. And I, I think, I, I do believe a lot of a lot of folks had to do some sensitivity training because there was a big issue, not only with that one, but just how people, black people were treated by these store owners in, in our community. And you know they had it was a big it was a big stink it was a, definitely a big stink about that. A lot of money got passed around because she was supposed to go to penitentiary. 
Damn. Did, uh, someone wants to know, did Johnny Cochran practice in Compton at one time? He may have been in Compton Court. Um, when, when you were state California State uh, a, a lawyer or attorney, you can pretty much pra- practice anywhere in California if, you know, if that's what you want to if, if you have a case there. So it was very possible he may have been in Compton. I don't know if he had an office in Compton. Is that what you asked? I'm not sure about that. But I know that I, I'm quite sure he may have did some, did some trials in Compton. Yeah. You know, going back to that time, um, the Latasha Harlins thing, was um, – I'm not going to ask you, actually. I'm completely having a brain uh, brain fart. But, um, okay, back to – oh, sorry. It was about the riots. Um, shit, Ron, what was I about to ask you? I had a question about the, law, the riots specifically. Oh, well, it was a spark for the L.A. riots. A lot of people would say that it was Rodney King that did that. But there was, it was, there was stuff bubbling in the streets before Rodney King, right? Already getting pissed off. We was already getting pissed off. Latasha Harding came first, and Rodney came. Uh, Rodney King came not too far behind that, and that was kind of very. That was kind of kind of kind of. All right, it's, it's all now. Damn it, we tired of this bullshit. I mean, when you when you saw Rodney King get beat, and they cut the, the cop said he kept moving. You are whipping my ass. How can I not move? Okay, if my body was dead, I still would have a reaction. And for them to get off on that situation, oh, dude, it was that was that's like somebody just slapping you upside the face and say, I didn't hit you. Oh, and everybody saw it. And this is just this is this is when technology came into it came into play with law enforcement and citizens being aware of what the cops do when they, they don't think nobody's watching. They thought nobody was watching. That's why they that's why they did what they did. All of a sudden, nobody didn't do nothing because everybody saw them do something. That, and that was a crack. crack I, ain't, I can't say I got guests in the house. But that was some bull. Straight bull. Okay. Yeah. I was probably 12 at that time, if my math serves me correct. So I don't remember the impact that it had on the community at that time and society in that time. You were older than me at that time, Lonzo. Talk to me about the impact of seeing the video of Rodney King getting his ass whooped by the cops. Dude, that was that was some devastating stuff right there because you saw you felt them blows. You saw the impact in which they was whooping on him. It was like they were taking uh, batting practice on my on, on my man, and after you saw him, I, I he looked after he got through getting whooped. Um, it was just it was very de- it was hard to deal with, man, because at any given moment that could be one of us. You know, I do when I when you had interaction with the police like I have, and you almost had to eat cheese to keep from getting beat up or getting getting jumped or whatever the case may be. That's a bad humiliating feeling, man. That's very humiliating, very humiliating. Okay, and if you and it's a trigger. It could be a trigger for a lot of people. And dude, to see him get beat the way it was, it definitely was very triggering for me. I see a question here um, by Isaiah uh, Edwards. Ask that question, Doc. Hey, Uncle Zoe, how are you related to the people in the Starks TV show? How am I related? I'm trying to figure that one out. What's the Starks TV show? Oh. Remind everyone and us. Wait a minute. Related? Yeah, see, how, hey, Uncle Zoe, how are you related to the people in the Starks TV show? Oh, Sparks, Sparks. Sparks TV show? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's the one in Compton? Sparks is in America. Oh, that's the one with Uncle Phil. Uh, let's see, Sparks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was, that was uh, uh, Miguel Nunez, uh, Terrence Howard, if I'm mistaken. It- well, his name is Alonzo Sparks. I think that's what you mean. I think because the guy who played Sparks, his first name was Alonzo, but that ain't that's not the same Alonzo if that's what you're thinking, right? No, no, no. It was um I'm not related to him, I, but I, I know the story behind that TV show. Uh a good oh, okay. buddy, break it down. A good buddy of mine, Judge uh Cal- Kelvin Filer, he is a judge in Compton right now, and that TV show was uh about the story behind his brothers and his dad. Who were all lawyers, but the dad could not pass the bar. He took the, took the bar like 20 times before he finally passed it. The, the the facade that they used in the very beginning of the show was from Compton. It was on Compton Boulevard. And when I interviewed um, Kevin, uh, Judge Filer, he told me about the whole thing. I forgot about the whole TV show. It was, it was uh, Miguel Nunez, Terrence Howard, um, my girl... Um, Damn, played played auntie in, in Friday, the first auntie. Uh, oh, damn, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. And Kim, 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 Kim Whitley and uh, mm-hmm. 
and uh, Mike Tyson, ex- Mike Tyson's ex-wife. Um, oh yeah, oh she was so beautiful. Uh, Robin, from Robin, different Robin, world. Yeah, there you go. Robin Gibbons. They, they were all in the show, and it was a comedy, and it was a big joke about how the dad couldn't pass the bar. All the all the sons passed the bar one or two times. It was in. They was lawyers. It was based out of Compton, and like I said, the uh, the facade of the building that was supposed to be the office was a office building in Compton based around some Compton lawyers. And that's something I didn't, I've, I just I just realized it again after Judge Father um, reminded me. But he's a good buddy of mine. He always comes comes to all my mixers. Nice. Okay. I low-key had a crush on Kim Whitley. Mm-mm-mm. She I, could I, get I it. I was 12. Oh, did you? I did. Yeah. Talk to yeah. me, player. Yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. No. Um, it was doing <laughs> Dude, it was a um, it wasn't even a date per se. It was uh, my cousin uh, was dating one of her friends, and her friend wouldn't go out with him unless her friend came along with her. And I was I volunteered to go out with her friend, and her friend was Kim Whitley. So we went to the Magic Castle. My cousin had a limousine, so we all in the limousine kicking it, okay. And uh, me and Kim kind of hit it off. We was cool. We, I, I, dug, I got a phone number right to this day. And but she was doing a she was doing a, I think a Nickelodeon show out of out of um, a Florida at the time. And we didn't we never got a chance to really to really really connect. We was kind of vibing. We talked a few times on the phone. And she was she was out of town most of the time. I was still doing my thing. And from time to time, I see her. The last time I saw her was at um, I saw her at Paul Mooney's funeral, and we kicked it for a hot minute. Got a quick picture. And hug a hug and kept on stepping. Yeah, I think we're gonna have to uh, bring Rosetta in on the show uh, in the near future, Lonzo. Yeah, she, I, she, she would love that. I'd love to have her. She, she let's be a do it. Boy. Let's yeah. do it. Let's do it. That sounds good. We need a female voice every once in a while to chime in and, and give give her thoughts. Hey, I guess last question. Uh, let's see. Creeping on a come up films wants to know if you have any stories about Easy E and his grenade. Grenade. There's a picture with him in a grenade, right? Yeah, and nah, I don't know that. Maybe you can end it with the uh, the story about you walking through the mall and seeing them yeah. dancing with guns right before their tour. Yeah, um, in Carson Mall back in the day, they had a store called HQ. I bought all my guns from HQ. It was like a Western surplus type place. You go in there, they had bow and arrows and guns, shotguns and rifles and all kind of survival stuff. And um, I'd already got, I had a couple of guns already, but this time I'm going to the store. We we're about to go on tour. The one of the one of the few times, the few times we were all about to go on tour together. Jerry Hell had booked a tour. Uh, they were my opening act. World Class Wrecking Crew was the headliner. Me, Battle Cat, Richie Rich, and Mona was headlining the show. But they had NWA, Easy E, Ice T, and Just Ice on the show. And I was the only non-gangster on the show. So I go to the Carson Mall to get me some new draws and some new stuff. Cause you know, back then. Going to the airport, you had to be dressed to go to the airport because people could walk you all the way to the gate. And we wanted to look good in the airport. So I'm going to buy me some drawers and some what, an outfit or whatever the case may be. I passed by the HQ, and they're all in HQ. They got submachine guns. and I mean, semi-automatic machine guns with scopes and, and all kinds of stuff. What the fuck are y'all doing? I mean, we're about to go on tour. What, what tour are y'all going on? Same one you're going on. I'm going on a musical tour. Y'all look like y'all going on a tour of Vietnam or some shit. No, nah, man, we got to be ready. Be ready for what? And they bought that back then. You could, you could, you could ask, you could buy a a, 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 um, a rifle over the counter, shotgun over the counter, no waiting. Okay, I think you still can now. But yeah, and they took that shit on tour with them. I think they got caught with them too. There it is. I think we got about a minute left, Lonzo. You want to knock your knock your thing out the park? Hey, folks, check it out now. Just so you, if you don't know, now you know. The Eve After Dark documentary is now on Tubi, folks. It is now on Tubi. No fee. It's free. Got to watch a commercial, but it's on Tubi now. Check it out, folks. Pass the word. Get my numbers up, folks. Also, thank you. I want to thank y'all. We got 15,000 organic viewers. I just hit 15,000 a day, folks. I was Subscribers. Subscribers. I'm sorry. We got 15,000 subscribers, folks. I got to double this in the next year. All right? In the meantime, this is Lonzo, the godfather of West Coast Hip Hop. And like I say every week before I go, for those who never heard of me, I'm the first one to put Dr. Dre in the surgery. I'm put uh took ice cube in the freezer <laughs> until he got cold on the eve after dark, 50-yard line Super Bowl. In the movie straight out of Compton, they played me like a hater of rap. 
Don't believe in the Hollywood bullshit because it was all cap. My history goes deeper than y'all will ever know. Just remember that NWA stands for not without Alonzo. Peace.